And just for a moment, feel your feet on the floor. Pull your focus and your awareness down to your feet and let that be your focal object for a moment to ground yourself. And imagine breathing down into your feet. Very simple and direct. Your contact with the floor. And reviving, may all sentient beings possess happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings not be separated from happiness that is free of suffering. May they abide with equanimity, free from attachment, hatred, and indifference. Okay, so today we're going to look at immeasurable love particularly, but before we do, um, I thought we could review what happened on Wednesday and just see if it was clear. So on Wednesday, you started looking at refuge and you were looking at your own relationship with this word and you were looking at the Buddhist concept both. Do you remember what do we take refuge in? First of all, shout it out. And the, the clearer I hear you, the quicker we'll move on. So, you know, if you know the answer, shout it out. Doesn't have to be perfect. What do Buddhists take refuge in? Buddha, Sangha, and Dharma. Yes. Yofi? <laughs> Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Excellent. And... Uh, Special credit, if you remember, like an analogy, the Buddha is the doctor, then what is the Dharma and the Sangha? Yeah, like medicine, like nurses. Yeah, okay, you'll have to speak quite loudly for me to hear you with your microphone, just so you know, because I can barely hear you, but um, so Buddhists take refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha. This is quite clear. You've known this for a while. Why do we take refuge in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha? Why are they reliable? What, what's our criteria for reliability? Do you remember some of them, even if it's not perfect? Why do we think they're suitable to take refuge in? Logic. Can you say a little louder? I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. Experience. Logic. Logic. And experience. And experience. Yes, very, yeah, nice. Very nice. Does anyone remember the particular, the particular logic? Or just some ideas about why? And this isn't about agreement or disagreement, right? First of all, we just want to clarify what do Buddhists think? And then you decide, I like it, I don't like it. I take it on board, I don't take it on board. But just kind of so you understand our, our worldview and then you can use what is useful to you. It was those ideas about the, the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, the Buddha particularly is free from fear, skilled in freeing others from fear, has unbiased love and compassion and helps all sentient beings regardless of whether they help or harm. So this, this impartial quality is what we believe is one of the important criteria for something to be a suitable refuge object. So I think it's important to understand that in Buddhism, we don't think that Buddha, Dharma and Sangha are the only suitable objects of refuge. They're just our objects of refuge. So we think that any religion or any spiritual tradition or any philosophy 
as a founder and a set of tools and a community that is genuinely helping people free themselves from the fear created by the uncertainty in their minds around negative states of mind, around achieving happiness, around uh, social harmony, you know, environmental connectedness about an understanding of interdependence, any, any philosophy, set of tools and community that frees sentient beings from fear and has founding members who have actualized that path, we think is suitable. Um, and the community has to be something that is in, in resonance with those core values that actively supports each other in enacting that. So there's even uh, vows that we take, lay people or ordained people, t bodhisattva vows, tantra vows, above the lay vows, which are, we cannot criticize other religions. We can argue with some points of philosophy in a friendly debate. We can say that, philo that part of your philosophy might be problematic, let's discuss it. But we never make a blanket statement that a whole religion or philosophy is bad or wrong because we don't know which philosophies or religions came from enlightened minds exactly to suit beings who needed those type of trainings. So we might say that, um, I don't know, maybe Moses was a bodhisattva, maybe, maybe not. If his teachings led to people having ethical discipline and more happiness, then maybe he was and his teachings were perfect. Maybe Jesus was a bodhisattva or a Buddha, if his teachings and his disciples are moving towards the development of their fullest potential. Maybe psychoanalysis, maybe Heinz Cote, it's, it's like it's just too early to assess, but the possibility is there. We have no idea who is enlightened and who isn't. So the, the key criteria are free from the fear of the uncertainty of what your untamed mind creates and an unbiased attitude towards all sentient beings, not being partial, not being preferential. Um, do you have any thoughts about that or, or questions about that? Kind of our criteria for a suitable refuge? Does it remind you of anything or make you curious about anything? Okay, we can let it brew some more. And so the refuge is towards positive states of mind. What's an example of a positive state of mind? For example, love. And then it's from or away from negative states of mind. What's a negative state of mind? For example, anger. And remembering that in Buddhism, these words have different definitions than in the world. And why do we go for refuge? out of fear and faith, which are horrible religious sounding words, but actually have a very deep meaning. And the meaning is that we have a healthy fear or apprehension or acknowledgement in what our untamed mind can create. And we have some conviction or faith based in reason and logic that the three jewels offer tools, okay? So that's, that's kind of Buddhism in a nutshell, understanding refuge in a nutshell. This is the presentation from the Lam Rim, the stages of the path. Um, and, you know, we'll keep going more and more deeply into it, but um, it's something important to understand as the core of the Buddhist belief system. So most Mahayana Tibetan Buddhist prayer and meditation practices start with the same preliminary motivation prayers. They start with refuge in bodhicitta and then the four immeasurable thoughts. So again and again and again, every single practice, no matter what it's specifically aiming at, in Tibetan Buddhism is gonna start with refuge in bodhicitta and the four immeasurable thoughts. And these are our kind of um, motivating and reviving motivation and recalibrating, reconnecting 
again and again and again these two prayers. So the refuge prayer is something along the lines of this, refuge and bodhicitta. So the first half is about refuge, the second half is about bodhicitta. I go for refuge until when? Until I'm enlightened. To what? The Buddha, the Dharma, the Supreme Assembly, meaning the Sangha. By the merit or the positive karma or the mental momentum that I create from giving, right, generosity, and the other perfections like ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, wisdom that we did that retreat on, may I attain the state of a Buddha? Why do I want to be a Buddha? In order to benefit all sentient beings. So it's repeated three times for emphasis, for depth, and uh, this is a very common version of the refuge in bodhicitta prayer, but you'll see lots of variation. And then you'll have some variation of the four immeasurable thoughts, and sometimes the order will be love, compassion, joy, equanimity, and sometimes equanimity is first. And it's not like it's uh, wrong or right per se. There's a, there's a particular meaning for having equanimity first or having equanimity last. And we'll talk more about that when we get to equanimity. But today we're going to focus namely on a measurable love. So this is may all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. So You've heard this prayer now many, many times in very various variations. And I think it's really important to sit with when we say may all sentient beings have happiness, we don't mean like hedonic pleasure. We mean the deep happiness, the deep contentment that comes from positive karma ripening. And when we want them to have the causes for happiness, we're not talking about like chocolate and lovers and vacations. We're talking about the conditions that ripen positive karma, the causes being positive states of mind like love, compassion, wisdom, all these positive states of mind are the causes for happiness. So when we're saying we want them to have happiness in the causes of happiness, we're really saying we want them to practice ethics deeply for their own sake, for the sake of others, for their present and for their future. Yeah, it's not some sort of superficial, may everyone be just sort of happy, happy. It's not like that. It's not cheesy. It's not rose colored glasses. It's a deep, deep prayer to yourself and aspiration for sentient beings. Please have ethics. And when we say ethics, we mean non-harmfulness. Okay, so there might be many different definitions and connotations of the word ethics or morality. In Buddhism, the connotation is non-harmfulness. But kind of an active restraint, which sounds like a paradox or a contradiction to actively restrain. But underneath that is an assumption that left to our own devices, left to our untamed minds drives, we have a built in ignorance, which then facilitates self cherishing, getting worse and worse. So if we don't kind of take the reins of our own mind, it will get worse, it will get more selfish, it will suffer even more. An undisciplined mind can find lots of temporary happiness. But an undisciplined mind has a very difficult time finding deep contentment. So this aspiration is not a simple thing that we're asking of ourselves and that we're wanting for others. There's a karmic implication, which means a mind training implication. What seeds do we want others to have? So then your work becomes a lot more about looking at the deep, deep reasons for people's suffering, as opposed to the surface conditions in their life, which water the seeds of their suffering. And then you don't want to just do symptoms relief, you want to go to the cause. And then the question becomes, what's the deepest cause 
you can help them with. And if you take something that is not your work with your patients, if you take something more ordinary every day, like the people in your family, for example, you all come home from work and school and talk and you're having dinner, someone's had a bad day. That someone, whether it's your child or your spouse or whoever, there's a level at which you can facilitate relief of their suffering or support of their happiness but it depends on their level of receptivity, right? For some people, all you can do is feed them food and that will help a little, that will help bring down their suffering, that will help elevate their happiness. And that is significant and that is important. But if you only give food to someone who can go more deeply, something is lost, right? If you think we could have a deep conversation about this pattern that keeps happening day after day, but instead of doing that, I'm going to give you a snack, <laughs> right? That would be um, a missed opportunity. But for some people, there is or some days particularly, there's no space to talk about the deep things, the habitual things, the problematic behaviors that keep coming up. All you can offer is some soothing with sensory things. So we're not putting down surface comfort. We're looking at when is it all we can offer and when is it a type of laziness or an excuse to kind of like settle the suffering but not actually go to the depths when there's an opportunity to go to the depths. Yeah, does it make sense? So may all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness, then we're really asking deep questions about what are the actual causes for happiness, as opposed to samsara symptoms relief, as opposed to just kind of hedonic pleasure. So sometimes when you read that prayer, it feels triggering because you think, yeah, 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 that's sweet, but also for my enemies or the people I disagree with, or evil dictators, I don't want them to have happiness. If they have happiness, won't they get worse? There can also be those questions like, do I really want difficult people or problematic people or people with a lot of power and influence that they're using badly to have pleasure and happiness? And again, you don't want them to have this kind of like hedonic pleasure, ego satisfaction. That's not particularly useful. Yes, they can get worse. What we're wanting for them is the deep contentment that comes from a trained, ethical, altruistic mind. So we do want happiness for all sentient beings, but not this superficial one. So then you can wish it pervasively, equanimously, without any points of kind of tension and resistance of, oh, but what if happiness will make this person worse. We're not talking about ego gratification. We're talking about deep contentment. And if you think of your own self and your own experience, you know there's different types of happy mind. There's the happy mind that comes from feeling deeply connected to your work and your values, that is deeply connected to being of benefit and feeling connected. And that's not like an excited, agitated type of joy. It's like a powerful place of comfort. It's like a deep resting place of peace with all these kind of little sparkles of joy in it. But it's not excited and it's not demanding and it's not hungry. And that kind of happiness can be developed and deepened and developed and deepened. And that's what we're aiming towards. And that's the potential of this mind. All the little like crumbs of happiness, this is kind of incidental and sometimes it's the best we can do, but it's not the point. So today we're looking at love particularly. So it's important, and I know we've done this before, but it's important to look at the associations both positive and negative that we may have with this word love that may or may not correlate with the Buddhist view. So I'm going to give you a list. Um, you know, it's not an exhaustive list. It might not be your list, 
but divorced from Buddhist philosophy, if you just heard the word love, what associations does it have for you? So some associations might be love has a connotation of safety, but maybe also sacrifice. That those you love, you feel some obligation to give up something, or there might be some cost to it. Or it might be that feelings of love create a feeling of safety. Depends, but these are some associations we bring. So then very naturally with that comes ideas about family and with that comes feelings of attachment. Attachment in the sense of exaggerated expectations, pressures, um, you know, negotiations, all sorts of things about obligation. So that can have a negative sense, but then the family side can have quite a positive sense, a nourishing sense. So, you know, it's like, is love helpful or unhelpful, good or bad? This word has so many meanings. Love might immediately bring a sense of like life. What is life about? Life is about love. Or what gives life? Love gives life. But love also could have that sense of loss that if you love someone, you're opening the door to grief. You're opening the door to grief. And that's one of the problematic associations we have with love, is that if you love someone and they go, it's somehow your job to have grief. And from a Buddhist perspective, that's not necessarily the case. So then there's other ideas like loyalty, respect, patience. These are all associations we might have with love. What is it to feel love from someone? Yeah, towards you. Sometimes love towards you feels like respect or feels like loyalty, or you have a sense that they're going to be patient with you through the tough times. Your love for other people might have these associations. These might be your assumptions about what this word carries. Of course, some people have the association of like sexual pleasure or romance with love. Some people might have more of a, a sense of laughter and friendship. And pretty much pervasively, everyone's going to agree that love has a sense of warmth and affection. Okay, so these are associations that may or may not correlate with the Buddhist view. So if you were to make an educated guess, what do you think of these resonate with the Buddhist view or don't resonate with the Buddhist view? Yeah, if you were to just make an educated guess, what do Buddhists mean by love? Here's what they do mean. Here's what they don't mean. Patience. Patience is uh, in the keep in the Buddhist category or get out of the Buddhist category? Yeah. Uh, secure, it's like confused. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you, which is in Hebrew, are there many words for love, like in Greek, or is there just one word and it can mean different things in different contexts? Is there just one word for love in Hebrew? More or less. More or less. <laughs> love, love. There is affection, there is like, but even like is love sometimes. You right. Like, you say, I love you, I love chocolate. Right, right. It's not like Spanish, where if you say one sense of I love you to the wrong person, it has all sorts of extra meaning and can become very embarrassing. You say, te amo, and they're like, oh, geez. Oh. <laughs> right. Not like that. So Hebrew is similar to English. Depends on context. Yeah. Look, and remember what I said last week about this being intellectually very easy? And sometimes it's hard for us smart people who have been thinking about life for many decades to go into this simple conversation. But remember that you don't have pervasive love all the time. Sometimes you are very grumpy. 
right? So we have to ask ourselves what blocks the heart so that we can address it, so that we can expand the love that we already have. So, so don't let yourself get triggered by the fact that these are simple ideas on the surface, right? You understand this word your whole life, and yet there is problems in practicing it consistently. There is problems in feeling it consistently. Yeah. Okay. So jump in if you have thoughts, but I'll, I'll keep going. Yeah. How come you call it a immersion? You teach the immersible thoughts while we are talking about love, okay? Which is an affection, as I assume. And well, immeasure about the motivation. With the the uh, you define it by the motivation, so it's a thought. But you are talking about the heart. So there are two levels. Well, this is a good point because in Buddhism, the word for heart and the word for mind are the same word. They are the same word. So this becomes the, a philosophical question for you guys as analysts is to ask yourself, do thoughts create a heart experience or do heart experiences create thoughts or is it chicken or egg? Or is it a collaboration? Is it a skill? Or is it a natural ability? Or all of the, the above? Because from a Buddhist perspective, we all have the capacity for love, but how deeply it goes is a trainable skill. It's a trainable skill. It's not like you have this percentage of love and that's the only percentage you will ever have your whole life and it cannot be changed, it's just your personality. We say you have a certain amount that you came in with, an ability to give, an ability to receive, based on your karma, based on your conditioning, nature and nurture and karma, all the things, your ability to love either increased or decreased as your life went on, but none of that is stuck in time, none of that is permanent, and if you want to be more loving, and if you want to receive more love, you can train your mind to do that, which is the same thing as training the heart from a Buddhist perspective. So just because it starts intellectual as a series of thoughts, doesn't mean it stays intellectual as a series of thoughts. This is why there's so much emphasis in the repetition because it's through repeating that it moves from head to heart. And here I'm using Western ideas, head to heart. From a Buddhist perspective, it's that the repetition grows the depth in the heart so it becomes more and more experiential. So love is a skill, it's a tool, and it's trainable from a Buddhist perspective. So it's, it's part of why I'm talking about, here's all these associations we have with it, as if they're self-evident. But of course, my list of what comes along with the word love might not be the same as your list. And is it even the Buddhist list? We haven't even gotten to the Buddhist list. So it's important to like clean up the word and take out of it what has just been socialized into it. Yeah, what has been conditioned into it, what's been trained into it from afflicted people doing the best that they could. We want to come back to the word with fresh eyes. Yeah, and then retrain ourselves to have a more kind of clean and functional form. Does it answer your question or, or do you have a follow up thought? Yeah, I, I understand it's a um, state of mind, right? State of mind, state of heart, same, same, yep. By repetition of this motivation, like I, I'm used to practicing emptiness. This is what I was used to, what was taught, okay? So you can reach it not only by a repetition on the motivation, right? I didn't know this till the last years, right? Yeah, and, you know, in the Tibetan tradition, there is more emphasis on 
intellectual analysis, debate and discussion prior to meditating, because you're using more parts of your mind to collaborate with this one idea you hold so important. And also you remove the problematic par portions or the um, inefficient strategies before you even start, right? Like you could say, meditate on love without any discussion whatsoever. Everyone go, meditate on love, go, <laughs> right? And you'd be like, ah, okay, um, my parents, my spouse, my children, something, something, okay, right? But it would have all these associations that I just put up on the board, good ones and bad ones, healthy ones and unhealthy ones. So we talk about it first to clean it up, and then you realize you do have experience of a purer form sometimes, but you've mushed it all together with the less pure forms or the less healthy forms, and it's all just one big mass of experiences all jumbled together. So we talk about it to clean it up, to tidy it, and then to bring it back to the mind and the heart to resonate with a different part of experience that we want to come more forefront. So this systematized approach helps efficiency. It helps depth and it helps prevent mistakes. So it's said that some traditions that just go straight to meditation with very little analysis are very good for people who have a lot of correct associations from previous lives. They don't need to go through and tidy it up because they already have in past lives, or they've had the type of life in this life that has already been the right kind of container for that work. But from a Tibetan Buddhist perspective, particularly the Geluk tradition, our tradition, we assume that we're smart, educated people with a lot of problematic emotions. And our good intelligence gets all tangled up with our emotions positively and negatively. So it's worth a deep discussion before you sit with a simple idea, because it's actually not so simple. Yeah, so this systematized approach, this is what we do in analytical meditation. And I know that analytical me meditation sometimes has an experiential quality right away. And sometimes it feels very intellectual. And it's important to kind of have patience with yourself that some days you're gonna have that resonance of experience and that depth of really touching the heart and some days you won't. And that doesn't mean a good day or a bad day or a good meditation or a bad meditation. It's progressive, yeah. And sometimes when you're being led through guided meditations the pace of the meditation leader is going to be different than everyone in the room. So what you're really doing is learning the meditation so that you can do it by yourself in your own speed by yourself at home. Right, you're learning the process and sometimes while learning the process, you're also able to do it. But if you're not, that's not really a problem from our perspective because it's only the first time. So we take these conversations about the four immeasurable thoughts, for example, in the nunnery, we might have a teaching on the four immeasurable thoughts every week for a year as the subject of public talks, right? And then during the rest of the week, we have, you know, our more in-depth philosophical topics. But what happens is that by talking about it and discussing it once a week for a year, then every time we do that short little prayer, it's got more depth and more resonance. The same words feel different. So it's that kind of conditioning we're trying to do so that the four immeasurable thoughts almost become our default way of thinking. But, you know, it takes a lot of effort for it to become effortless, as Tenzin Pomo would say. Okay, so analysis is important <laughs> from a Buddhist perspective. Very, very important. So these are our associations, more words than this, no doubt. These are not necessarily the Buddhist associations, though some of them are. So there are other times this word comes up in Buddhism. It comes up in the perfection of generosity. 
For example, um, when we talk about the perfection of generosity, there's those four types you might remember from our retreat. Material generosity, the generosity of loving kindness, generosity of offering freedom from fear, and dharma generosity. So here we are talking about love, but we're not necessarily talking about immeasurable love that can become one of these higher meditative states, which has the connotation of immeasurable, but it's also not contradictory either. It's still got the same connotation of divorced from attachment, wanting sentient beings to have happiness and offering them that. It also comes up the word love in the sevenfold cause and effect, which you'll do a little bit more next semester, but you've seen before, I think, which is an analytical way into bodhicitta. So recognizing all sentient beings as mother, thinking about their kindness, wishing to repay their kindness, those three are a catalyst for loving kindness. You think, what do mothers want? My kind mother sentient beings, what do they want? They want happiness. So I will offer them happiness. And in that sense, loving kindness. What don't they want? They don't want suffering. Therefore, I offer them compassion. Is it enough to just want those things for them? No, I need to take responsibility to help bring that about. So that's great compassion, the highest intention, which becomes the catalyst for bodhicitta. So the word love comes up in Buddhism in those two instances, um, but it's not exactly the same sense as immeasurable love. Okay, so what is immeasurable love specifically? So it's got that same sense that all the forms of love have, which is it's the wish for sentient beings to have happiness. That's the pervasive definition that all forms of love in Buddhism have. It understands the causes for happiness and supports them. The causes for happiness being ethics, altruism. And then it's an affectionate attitude that sees sentient beings as appealing or attractive even. Not attractive in a romantic sense, but attractive in a warmth, affectionate sense. And so immeasurable love has all of these connotations that love in Buddhism generally has, but then it also has an added sense of being able to be a dhyanic state or one of the jhanas, a meditative absorption. But these are the most important things to understand. The concentration levels, it's an interesting conversation we'll have in a few weeks, but really this is the essence of what we wanna understand about it. So an affectionate attitude that sees sentient beings as appealing and attractive. It, easier said than done, right? But this is what we're aiming for. Okay, so then where does it come from in the Buddhist thought? Um, the four measurables are actually taught many, many times in many different sutras. Here is one of them. It's called the Metta Sutra, and it's one of the most famous. So I thought I would just read it to you so you have a sense of it. It says, may all beings be happy and safe. May their hearts be happy. Whatsoever living beings that exist, weak or strong without exception, long, stout or medium, short, small, or large, those seen or unseen, those dwelling far or near, those who are born and those who are to be born, may all beings without exception be happy. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere. In anger or ill will, let them not wish to harm each other. Just as a mother would guard her only child at the risk of her own life, even so toward all beings, let him cultivate boundless mind. Let thoughts of boundless love pervade the whole world. Above, below, and across, without obstruction, without any hatred, without any enmity, whether standing, walking, or sitting, lying down, and as long as they are awake, they should develop this mindfulness. This, they say, is the highest conduct here, not falling into wrong views, virtuous and endowed with vision. 
So then this particular sutra and many others were clarified by Buddha Gosha. And Buddha Gosha was, um, he's a Pali tradition scholar and people aren't sure where he was born, but he traveled extensively in Sri Lanka. Um, and he discovered many Sinhalese Buddhist commentaries. These he translated into Pali and communicated to his countrymen, including teachings on the four immeasurable thoughts, these Brahma Viharas. So you'll hear references to this text, the path of purification. So the path of purification by this, we think Indian scholar who traveled in Sri Lanka, the path of purification is kind of the heart commentary on the four immeasurable thoughts and particularly for the Pali tradition. So he took the Metta Sutra and many other sutras and many other um, Buddhist texts and he translated them and disseminated them. So this is kind of fifth century. Um, this is from Alan Wallace. So he's just kind of clarifying that the word for loving kindness in Sanskrit is Maitri or Metta in Pali and Jampa in Tibetan which is related to the word for friend, okay? So a prosaic translation for this word is simply friendliness. In English, friendliness describes a mode of behavior, a friendly way of behaving. That's certainly a component of the meaning intended here, but loving kindness is essentially a quality of the mind, although it of course expresses itself in behavior. So then the essential nature of loving kindness is a yearning that the person on whom you are focusing your mind be well and happy. And then we expand this yearning in a prayer that seems enormously rich as I, meaning Alan Wallace, reflect on it over the years. So you think, may you be free of enmity, may you be free of affliction, may you be free of anxiety, may you be well and happy. And then you bear in mind that the object of one's loving kindness may be oneself, another human being, an animal or a sentient being. Also, um, it may be mental or physical. So these Buddhist teachings compiled by Buddha Gosha start off the practice of loving kindness by focusing first upon ourselves. And this is really important because sometimes people think that Buddhists neglect oneself or that their altruism doesn't include themselves. The Buddha declared, whoever loves himself will never harm another. So not in an egocentric way, not in a hedonic way, but in a genuine loving way. If you love yourself, you will not harm others. There's a lot of depth to be drawn from that. So Buddha Gosha's fifth century text is strikingly pertinent in our society because we seem to be particularly afflicted by low self-esteem, self-contempt, self-denigration. It's very common, especially amongst Americans, not unheard of in Europe, but they seem to be less subject to this type of affliction than our Americans, right? This, this idea that we, um, particularly Americans, but you know, people in Israel too, have this like low self-esteem default position while at the same time having a very arrogant affect, right? This is something we think about Americans, it's sometimes things that people say about Israelis that they seem very arrogant and yet they have terrible self-esteem. So I, I won't speak about Israelis, but certainly this is true for Americans and it's kind of a fascinating paradox that you would have this huge hubris and this big ego and this grandiose way of speaking, but you actually feel like you're terrible, you're worthless, etc. So there's all sorts of brilliant things that psychoanalysis says about those vertical splits and horizontal splits and all sorts of splits. Discuss amongst yourselves many good parallels I've heard you guys talk about, but in terms of getting over it, you have to love yourself. And that is a very interesting venture because afflictions are not lovable, nor should they be. Your anger, your laziness, your arrogance are not lovable and you should not love them, but they are not you. 
And that is the essential difference between Buddhism and a lot of ways of thinking you hear in the world. It's kind of like, love me, love my afflictions. No, in Buddhism, you have Buddha nature, you have suffering, you have a clear and knowing consciousness. There's a lot going on simultaneously. Your Buddha potential is saying, you can get out of this mess. You can train your mind out of this problematic way of being. There is nothing wrong that can't be resolved by the very mind that you have now. It's just a process of practice. And you are suffering because of habits of ignorance, etc. So wish yourself happiness means wish yourself freedom from the ignorance that drives the bad behaviors that plant the negative karmic seeds, which lead to your everyday suffering. Yeah. And so may I have happiness is really, may I stop hurting myself? May I stop hurting others? May I stop believing the lies of my ignorance? May I stop believing the projections of my ignorance? Thoughts? Okay, so clear so far? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yes, clear-ish. Yeah, good, okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, we're um, Sanskrit tradition practitioners in Tibetan Buddhism, but the Pali tradition also describes immeasurable love in a really helpful way. So I thought today we'd do a bit of Pali. Um, next week we'll do a little bit more Sanskrit. So this is from um, a Theravadan monk. He says, um, where Greek distinguishes between like sensual eros and spiritual agape, which I will mispronounce, English makes do with only one word for love. So Pali, like Sanskrit, has many words covering many shades of meaning. The word chosen by the Buddha for this teaching is metta, from mitta, a friend, or better, the true friend need. So this is just like what Alan Wallace was saying. So then we just add to that in Sanskrit, Maitri in Tibetan, Jampa, but all the same meaning. So in the Buddha's teachings, these four divine abidings, or these four Brahma Viharas, these four immeasurables, are the greatest of all worldly merit. If practiced alone without insight into the true nature of existence, can lead to rebirth in the highest heavens, the form and formless realms. But all heavenly existence without exception is impermanent, right? It changes. And at the end of the heavenly lifespan in the form or formless realm, no matter how long it may last, the being dies and is reborn according to his or her past actions. So even if you achieve the four immeasurables in terms of the, the dionic states, the form and formless realms, they're not permanent, it's not enlightenment. It's going in the right direction, but it's not enough if you don't have insight into the true nature of existence. So this is because some craving for existence for beings or non-beings, form or formless, and some sort of view of existence that is not in conformity with truth still remain latent in the person. So even in the form and formless realms, even when you've achieved a measurable love or a measurable compassion or all four of them, you have these like sleeping seeds, sleeping seeds of craving for a, a samsaric existence. And they'll burst out again when the result of the good actions that got you into those dionic states is spent or ripened or finished. And where one will be reborn after that is unpredictable, although it is certain that one will be reborn. So then right view gives insight into the real nature of existence of being and non-being with all its mirages and deceptions. And it is only with its help that the practice of loving kindness is perfected, lifted out of the impermanence of even the highest heavens and directed to the true cessation of suffering. So we have to combine it with the wisdom realizing emptiness. We have to take what we learned from tenants, 
what we know about emptiness and bring it to our understanding of each of the immeasurables. Otherwise it won't lead to states out of samsara. Okay, so then from your text, and this is on page 24 of the ebook, Buddha Gosha says that love has the aspect of friendliness as its characteristic, its function is to promote friendliness, and then it's manifested as the disappearance of malice and annoyance. Its proximate cause is seeing others as lovable. When it succeeds, it eliminates malice. When it fails, it degenerates into selfish, affectionate desire, attachment, basically. So just keep coming back to the essential qualities, the pith of what's being meant here, and then you marry it up with your understandings of insight. So combining the understanding of selflessness with love demolishes any sense of possession. Love infused with a sense of selflessness knows that ultimately there is no possessor or person to possess. There is no independent soul or essence in a person to love or to be loved. The highest love wishes beings to have the highest happiness and will show others the path to the end of suffering, the path realized and taught by the Buddha. Okay, so this part in bold is the most important. Love infused with a sense of selflessness knows that ultimately there is no possessor or person to possess. And yet we still wish them happiness and the causes of happiness. And this is the way you make your mind look at relative truth and ultimate truth and try to reconcile the two internally. Okay, so your follow up reading um, is this love section in your text. So just make a mental note. So in the ebook, it's pages 29 to 37. Your hard copy, it's pages 11 to 19. But it's the love section. So it will help clarify a lot of this. And I'll send you a reminder email, but just make a note there. And then your Wednesday reminder is the same as last week. Just continue to read that PDF in your email, as well as in Buddhism, One Teacher, Many Traditions, all of chapter two, eventually get it read from February 23rd to March 23rd, read chapter two. So before we finish, um, are there any parts that you really are curious to explore more deeply or parts that you're stuck on? And you can email me as well if that's easier. But particularly when you think about love married with the wisdom realizing emptiness, is it clear how that would happen? Or do you have ideas about how that happens? And why that's important? What happens when you have love that's immeasurable love, but you don't have an understanding of emptiness? What's the danger? Attachment. Attachment. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You got it. Just making sure. So can you elaborate maybe next time about the difference between the ultimate love and the conventional love that you said now? Yep. Yep, I will. And um, the, the brief explanation is you want all sentient beings to be happy while understanding that sentient beings do not exist from their own side. Happiness does not exist from its own side. You do not exist from your own side. Causes and results don't exist from their own side. So it's, it's like landing on a purpose while holding awareness of expansion. And so if you were just in this awareness of emptiness, it might get too abstract or too cold or too divorced from your immediate experience. But if you were just with the love component, you could start to think that a certain action gives happiness from its own side, or the certain behavior is loving from its own side, forgetting context, forgetting causes and conditions. And that's all fine until something is wrong, until something doesn't work. 
And the quote from my own teacher is always, when attachment is going, anger is coming. Yeah. And whenever you have anger, it's good to look at the attachment that was thwarted, that was contradiction, that was blocked. Basically, the lie was revealed, and now you're mad about it. So without an understanding of emptiness, or at least dependent arising, your love turns right back into attachment so easily. So just kind of sit with what you know about that, and we'll dig more into it next week. So dedicating all sentient beings, who although self and all appearances are dharmadhatu by nature, have not realized it thus. They're empty by nature. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well-being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. Okay, thanks very much. See you at the clinical seminar. Oh. Yeah.